as we talked about during Together Time, our children and youth last week reminded us of the importance of caring for our environment and how our actions affect our interdependence as human beings. We all share this beautiful, fragile planted planet. As our seventh principle reminds us, we are interdependent. We are woven together in a fabric whose intricacies we are just beginning to understand. All things are connected. Though we human beings have lived as if this were not the case. Sadly, in the West, much of our approach to creation care, actually our lack of care for creation, emerged from the most egregious mistranslation of the Hebrew scriptures. We were taught that human beings are to have dominion over the earth. Many scholars are now correcting that horrendous error and reminding people of faith that we are called to have dominion with other living creatures. Every time I study with my Sufi teacher, he makes sure he works in that error in translation into every workshop because he feels like it's the most, one of the most important things that he can teach. And so age after age, we have disregarded our relationships with one another, with other living creatures and the natural world. We have forgotten that ours is a relationship with creation that needs to be one of care, not domination. We are called to a practice, again from the Jewish tradition, that is tikkun olam, meaning the repairing and healing of the world. We are here to be those who help heal and repair so that our world may be transformed. As Unitarian Universalists, we take seriously our work to repair the world, to heal relationships with humans, and to heal our Mother Earth on which we dwell. It's often difficult to know what we can and should do. The needs are so vast, so as one of our children said, we recycle. That's important. We compost. That's important. We give to various organizations that work to heal the earth. That is important. This is work on a micro, local level. And yet we are learning that we cannot only work on a micro level. Our work needs to expand to the macro level to bring the cause of creation care to the halls of power. This is happening around the globe. For the first time, indigenous people are leaving the Amazon rainforest to speak to their government, to their powers that be. Like them, we are called to work to influence the laws that will affect the welfare of the earth within our nation and around the world. People from all backgrounds and political persuasions are working together to make a difference. And so, as we said earlier today, our Green Sanctuary Committee has asked us to consider involvement in the Citizens Climate Change Lobby. And thank you, Don, for coming all the way from North Carolina to tell us about the organization and what our community can do. Welcome. Thank you so much. Winter, dark, gray, cold. The trees bare in the twilight, the green leaves long forgotten from summer. Stillness grabs hold. We become stagnant, incapable of action, as it seems no action can change the state of being. But let's look closer. The gray, empty tree is holding the key to the next generation. 
the small inconspicuous buds that wait for their time to bloom, to shape the next season, to shape the future. The future of the branch on which they sit, the future of the animals that make it their home, the future of the forest and everything connected to it. Climate change is putting that future in jeopardy. The burning of fossil fuels, the burning of organisms that have long left this world are now dramatically changing our world. We can see it every day as record snowfall clogs the streets of Boston and collapses homes in Buffalo, as record drought destroys crops and livelihoods in California, and as record flooding drowns the Midwest and the Atlantic Ocean claims the streets of Miami for its own every high tide. The 100-year drought, the 100-year flood, the 100-year storm, these events are so extreme that w they would only occur once every 100 years, only once a century. How quickly that 100-year storm has become the 10-year storm. How quickly the high ground vanishes in the flood. How quickly we are changing our world. This is not the future we imagine for our family. Much like winter's grasp, so too has an action gripped Congress. Partisanship, money, and corporate influence have paralyzed the process. Cooperation and compromise have become dirty words. Actions that will only ensure those of pure convictions will win the next primary. Is this the democracy we have grown? Democracy is more than, a, more than an idea debated in ivory towers, more than a day that comes every other November, and more than a plastic voting booth. Democracy is the will of the people, the demands of the citizenry to flourish in a livable world. Too long have we asked the world to bear the costs of our dirty energy. Too long have we ignored the dangers uh, in favor of short-sighted conveniences and profits. We deserve better. Our families deserve better. We live in a world of great prosperity borrowed against our future. But as prosperity has concealed our collective genius, so will the challenge of transition reveal. The antidote to despair is action and it is our action that, that will shape the future. The two goals of the Citizens Climate Lobby is to create the political will for a stable climate and to empower citizens to have breakthroughs in ex exercising their own political power. Politicians do not create political will. They respond to it. And it's our responsibility to create that political will. How do we do that? How do we create political will? How do we influence our legislators? The most important thing we can do is talk to our legislators, meet with them. They're people just like us, and they represent us. They took that oath of office because they care deeply about their constituency. They care deeply um, about the challenges that we face as individuals. Oh, unfortunately, what, what we ask our members of Congress to do is be experts on every subject. Experts on climate change, experts on the environment, experts on the economy, experts on energy, experts on national security. Uh, a vast array of topics that influence uh, every part of our society. It's a, it's a task that no person could ever live up to. So they look for help. They're always looking for help. They want, to, they want people to tell them what information is going to be helpful for them to make these very difficult decisions. There are over 2,200 lobbyists on energy and environment alone in Congress. So a lot of our representatives only hear that side. They only hear the lobbyists saying, yes, let's drill more. It'll create jobs and cheaper energy for people in your district. This is good for your constituency. If that's all they hear, that's all they know. It's our job to stand up and say, no, there are, there are better ways to move forward. We are, we are the source of education for our representatives. But the only, way to, uh, the only way for us to communicate with them is to meet with them. Oh, ask for meetings with your members of Congress. Meet with their staff and tell them their concerns. You are their constituency, and they want to hear from you. The media is a very powerful tool for us to communicate with our, our elected officials. There's social media, Facebook, Twitter, all of these things are, are, are important. Uh, just as representatives get information from CNN, MSNBC, but it's, it's very disconnected. We have a much, much more powerful way to, meet, to connect and communicate with our representatives.
You can sign an online petition and send that to your representative. But how long does it take you to sign that online petition? A couple of clicks and you're done. So the, when a representative gets that, they think, oh, well, this didn't take anyone any time. I'm not going to take the time to read it. What's much more effective is to type out a letter and send it you know, through the post office. A physical, real letter. <laughs> well, that means so much more than one of the thousand emails they get every day. But we can do better. We can sit down and handwrite a letter. When was the last time you got a handwritten letter in the mail? It's been a while for me. It's been a while for your representative, too. If you really want to make a difference, if you really want your representative to read what you have to say and hear your voice, stand out. Make it unique. If you take the time and energy and effort, they will take the time. It's important for us to build broad coalitions, especially when it comes to environmental action. Climate change impacts all of us in a lot of different ways, which means that we have the opportunity to build an incredible coalition of diversity of people, businesses, and interests in order to make legislation happen. Uh, organizations just like this, uh, like the UU Church, faith-based organizations, have a, tremendous, have a tremendous voice and tremendous power. We just tap into it. We can make connections with businesses, the military, healthcare. All of these different uh, organizations are impacted by climate change, and we all can come together under one solution. CCL, the Citizens Climate Lobby, has grown exponentially since its founding seven years ago. Well, when I started volunteering, there were 50 groups throughout the United States uh, with only about 1,000 volunteers. Now we have over 200 groups throughout the U.S., Canada, and abroad with over 10,000 active volunteers. And I don't mean an active volunteer as in someone signed a petition. I mean an active volunteer who is going to meeting with people, talking with the community, getting in with their representative, and making their voice heard. We organize by congressional districts because representatives care deeply about their constituency. So that's how we approach them. We, we come to them on their terms. We build relationships with our representatives. And just like anyone else, if someone comes to you and says, you're doing a terrible job, I can do a way better job, you, the, this, is, this is horrible, you're, you're not going to pay attention to them. You're going to say, get out of here. But if we come to them with with open arms and see them as, as people, just, uh, just like our neighbors, just like our friends, and work to be their friend and the, and the person they turn to, our voice becomes much more powerful. My favorite example of this is with a representative in North Carolina's second district, uh, Representative Renee Elmers. She was elected in 2010 with the Tea Party wave and was a staunch Tea Party conservative. You know, made, the, made the establishment look very liberal. When, when, she, when she took office, we, we went and met with her. And we told her that, we, that climate change is a concern for us. And we asked her what it was her energy and environmental policy. And she looked at me and she said, drill. Now, we were hoping for a bit more of a diverse approach. <laughs> but that's where we started. She thought that Fossil fuels were the best way to move forward with, for her district and her people. That was the best way to help the people of North Carolina. Well, through our, but we didn't give up. We stayed persistent. We got more meetings with, in the district and in Washington, D.C. And over the last three years, we've shifted uh, Representative Elmer's belief that fossil fuels is not the only way forward but that an all-of-the-above energy strategy is the best for North Carolina. Instead of voting specifically for oil exploration only and dismissing any bills that supported renewable energy, she now has co-sponsored bills that look at an all-of-the-above energy option. Solar, uh, wind energy, and fossil fuel use. We've shifted her view. We've shifted her beliefs in the best way forward for our district and our country. And that's specifically because of the action that the citizenry has taken, that us as individuals have done. It, it didn't happen overnight. It took a lot of meetings, a lot of persistence to achieve. And our work isn't done, but we've seen phenomenal progress. 
We've seen the same in the Senate. Uh, the Senate uh, just recently voted on a resolution 98 to 1 that climate change is real. Just a few years ago, uh, Congress would frequently say, well, climate change, we don't even know if the science is real. We don't even know if it's happening. We now have almost an entire majority, both sides of the aisle, saying this is happening. Even more amazing, 15 Republicans voted on a resolution, uh, voted yes on a resolution saying that not only is climate change real, but it's man-made. We are the cause of climate change. And one of those 15 Republicans is South Carolina's very own Lindsey Graham. How quickly we are changing Congress. How quickly we are changing our world. When Ben Franklin emerged from the Constitutional Convention, a woman approached him and asked, what kind of government do we have? He said, a democracy, if you can keep it. Over 200 years later, we still have that democracy. But it has been missing the most important part of all, us. Each one of us is the bud on the winter tree. Each one of us holds the potential to transform the gray into the vibrant. Each one of us holds the power to shape the future of this country and our democracy. It is through our action that winter will fade into memory. It is through our action that we will move into the warm light of spring. Thank you. When you were talking, Don, it reminded me of stories that I've heard from actions in this congregation when, um, wasn't it Bernice Holt that um, Bert, uh, Strom Thurmond asked to, told her to sit down or get out of the room or something? I, I've heard it. So, so we have a history of um, working, and it, it was very nice of you to quote Benjamin Franklin, who was a good, though deist, a good Unitarian, who is the person who brought Joseph Priestley to this country. So uh, that UU connection. So thank you. Thank you for inspiring us to action. And we hope that many of you will choose to participate in the workshop this afternoon with Don uh, about how we can get specifically involved. That workshop starts at 1.00. But really, each of us must decide if this is part of the work that we can do to care for our Mother Earth. I mean, there's some really concrete things that Don talked about that can help us feel empowered. I was really impressed with some of the stories that you shared. And we need to do this work because we know how precious and precarious life on this planet is. We are coming to understand that the earth is indeed our mother. We are all nurtured by the abundant diversity of creation. And we are very fortunate. We're blessed to live in this part of the world where we know that we will have enough water. We know that the climate, even though last week was a little strange, that it's a moderate climate, that hopefully we won't suffer like the people in the Northeast. And yet, what will our future be? This is a very sacred place that we call home, but it may not always be so if we don't do our work to care for our Earth. Years ago, the great American teacher and holy man, Black Elk, who lived from 1863 to 1950, he had visions, and uh, one of his visions gave him these words. Then I was standing on the highest mountain of them all, and round beneath me was the whole hoop of the world. And while I stood there, I saw more than I can tell, and I understood more than I saw. For I was seeing in the sacred manner the shape of all things of the spirit and the shapes as they must live together like one being. 
and I saw that the sacred hoop of my people was one of many hoops that make one circle wide as daylight and starlight. And in the center grew one mighty flowering tree to shelter all the children of one mother and one father. And I saw that it was holy. May the flowering tree that shelters us all be protected and nurtured by the peoples of the earth. This is sacred work. May each of us do our part to care for and honor this precious blue boat home of ours.